Uh, so chapter ch chapter 14, both chapter 14 and 15, these are the last two chapters, and both of them are about the um, house defense and immunity. 14 is the basic part, the first part, uh, the, innate uh, the, the innate immunity. And just this is just an introduction as usual. It's we are talking about what is going to face any microbe that's trying to enter, not necessarily microbe, what's going to face anything that's trying to enter to our body or have a chance to enter to our body. What are we going to do to resist, resist that? Whether it's a microbe, whether it's an agent, uh, a physical agent, anything, even uh, dust, anything that can interact or enter to our body, what exactly are we going to do to try to, to stop it from entering? It might end up entering at the end, there would be an issue, but what are we going to do in order to prevent that as much as we can? Uh, there are a lot of things that we're going to talk about. Um, so the, 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 uh, the, the, the innate things, the natural things that we have, like our skin, for example, like uh, our nose, you, ha you, you know that you have hair in your nose to trap the dust, uh, the, the, the conchi inside our nose, to trap any dust, if it goes back more than that, goes in more than that, we have the cilia, and so on. We have a lot of things that are going to slow down and try to stop a, any uh, microbe or agent, anything. Doesn't have to be a microbe. Uh, so, host defenses. We will have two types, and this is important to remember these. Uh, host defenses are the first type, are, uh, we call it innate, and it's non-specific. And you need to follow uh, me with this one, you, you have to remember these. Uh, the first one is innate. Innate means we're born with those. It didn't uh, interact with anything, it's just natural things. And this is non-specific. Non-specific means they protect us against anything, whatever it is. Microbe, dust. Uh, any physical agent, anything, and it's not specific. It prevents just anything, okay? Unlike the acquired one, which is a specific one that we are not going to um, cover in this chapter. It's chapter 15, which is the specific one. This one is acquired. Acquired means we learn it. We acquire it later on, and this one is a specific. Uh, the innate one consists of two things, first line and second line. So first line is going to protect us first. If something uh, skip or, or can go through the first line, the second line will take care of it. Still non-specific. This slide is important to because this is what we're going to discuss in details, okay? So remember this. Host defenses again. We have innate that's non-specific and we have acquired that is specific. Non-specific is first and second line. Specific is third line. Is that okay so far? Mm -hmm. First line is the physical barriers, chemical barriers, genetic barriers. Three barriers that are going to try to prevent any intruder from getting into our body. The second line of defense is if something gets in, what are we going to do? If it skip or if it cross the first line, we have the second line. The second line is still non-specific. Is that clear enough? Still non-specific. The only thing that's specific, which we're not even doing this chapter, is uh, the third line, which is the T cells and B cells and their products that we will discuss later. So what's the second line of defense? Inflammation, uh, phagocytosis, interferon, and complement. All of these are the second line of defense that if something passed through the first line. So the innate one means, innate means present at birth, we are born with it, and it is non-specific resistance. It will take care of anything. And this is the first line and second line. The other ones that specific is acquired, which is adoptive immunity. Uh, something is going to happen later on to acquire it. And this is again all about T and B lymphocytes. 
So comparing the two, non-specific and specific, non-specific is first and second, the specific is the third. Is that clear? You need to remember this. Uh, the first and second are innate, the third is acquired. You are born with the both first and second, and both of them are non-specific. Um, the other difference is the non-specific is also does not include memory. You don't remember what's happening. You take care of something, and when it happened again, you don't remember what happened before, you just take care of it blindly, okay? While the third line, we will have a memory, and we will discuss all the details. Um, so the first line consists of physical barriers, chemical barriers, and genetic barriers, okay? Physical, chemical, genetic, three barriers. This is the first one. Uh, the physical barrier is skin, tears, cough, sneezing, sneezing. What's the difference between coughing and sneezing? Does anybody know? What's the difference between coughing and sneezing? Is it the same thing? No, both of them are doing the same job, which is expelling or getting rid of anything that's entering. But the difference is sneezing is upper respiratory and coughing is lower respiratory. If something is irritating your upper respiratory tract, you're going to sneeze. If something is irritating your lower respiratory tract, you're going to cough. Both cases, you are getting rid of something that's entering to our respiratory system. Skin is doing the same thing, tears are doing the same thing, mucous membranes are doing the same thing, and so on. Uh, the other thing is, uh, when in the first line, are the chemical barriers. We have chemical barriers everywhere. Low pH, does that mean acidity or alkalinity? Low pH, acidity. So the acidity is going to kill uh, different things, low pH. We also have lysozymes. Lyso means break down. Zymes means enzymes. These are enzymes that are going to break down cells, invading cells. Also digestive enzymes. Um, this is something like uh, our skin have some acidity, low pH. So if something could go to the, in contact with the skin, it will be killed. Okay, lysozymes are going to kill anything that come in contact, for example, the eye, the tears. The tears have lysozymes. So if something enters to your eyes, the tears are going to break it down. Digestive enzymes, when we eat something, of course, it is not sterilized, right? It's not clean. It's not that clean. Um, so your acidity in the stomach is going to take care of it. It's going to destroy it. Genetic barrier. That will be the next one, which is your, ge your genetic uh, makeup will prevent certain things from entering your body. It will make your cells unsuitable or not a good environment. So you will not be invaded with those anyway. And we will discuss the details. Second line is inflammation, phagocytosis, fever, interferon, and complements. Third line, which is the only one that's specific, um, is T and B lymphocytes, with the details that we will talk about. Uh, the first and second and third line, they are not working independently. We are working as a multi-level. They are working together. Physical barrier, cells, chemicals, all of these are going to uh, work together and there is some sort of overlap. And we will discuss that. So details. First line of defense, these are the barriers. Is that specific or non-specific? First line. Non-specific. Non-specific. How about the second line? Non-specific. Non the third is the only one that is specific, which is T and B. So the first line, which is non-specific, is basically physical barriers, chemical barriers, genetic barriers. All of these are going to block and they work together to block anything that's trying to enter. So, so some details, skin and mucous membrane. These are the first physical or anatomical barriers, skin and mucous membrane. <coughs> How the skin is protecting us or defending us. The skin contain uh, the outermost layer, if you remember A and B, 
it, uh, it is keratinized, remember this? Yeah. It's full of keratin, so it's very tough. And cemented together to be tougher. So something, if something trying to invade, that will be really hard. The other thing is related to the skin is sweat. So what's good about sweat? We know sweat is to regulate body temperature, right? But what is the function of the sweat regarding immunology, regarding defense? It has two things. Number one, flushing effects. It wash away anything that is there. The other thing is it contains some chemicals as well. Like, uh, remember the um, uh, sodium chloride that's in the sweat? So these electrolytes in the sweat plus the low pH, both of those are going to help the sweat to protect us. So sweat, we're talking about three different things. Sweat, flushing effect is one. Um, the electrolytes is two. And the pH is three. Three things are helping the sweat to uh, protect us. Uh, related to the skin and the mucous membrane, we have some secretions. Like sebaceous secretions. Remember the sebum that's secreted into the hair that contain antimicrobial agents? This is one. Uh, other secretions like my bobian glands. My bobian glands are also known as the tarsal glands. Do you remember the tarsus of the eyelid? Which is this, like this is upper eyelid, this is eyelid. it's here. Yeah. Which is preventing the two eyelids from sticking. Yeah. But this is not the only function. The other function is also antimicrobial. Okay? Mucous membrane is lining almost, let me just make it easier, any hollow canal, any hollow organ in our body, just like this. Uh, respiratory system is a hollow organ, right? So it's lining the, the digestive system, respiratory system, uh, genital system, urinary system. All of these are mucous membranes that are lining uh, the inside of each one of those um, uh, systems. Uh, other things related to that are blinking. When you blink, aren't you preventing things from entering? Like if you feel something coming to your eye, you blink, right? And you're blinking all the time. So this is for protection. Tears. Tears are doing exactly the same as sweat. So what, what's the tear? How is the tear helping us? Flushing effect. It's flush away anything that enters to the eye. And it also contains antimicrobial and low pH. Saliva. Fluids are doing the same thing, basically, okay? All fluids are doing very similar job. All of them are flushing and antimicrobial. So saliva. Uh, urine is another thing. The urine is doing a flushing effect, defecation, vomiting, anything that's any fluid that's leaving the body, it flush away things as it is leaving, right? Vomiting is leaving the body, flush out anything in its way, on, on its way. Defecation, same thing. Urination, same thing. Besides the fact that these are also having different pH that can be defensive. Uh, the cilia in the respiratory system is another thing. You guys remember these cilia, finger-like projections inside? It's like brush up anything that enters. And uh, nasal hair also will trap large particles. So these are the physical barriers. How about the chemical barriers? Is that first or second or third line of defense? First, still first. Is that specific or non-specific? Because both first and second are non-specific, right? So this is still the first. So the first we cover the physical barriers and now the chemical barriers or the chemical defense. What are the chemicals that are helping us? We talked about part of it. Lysozymes, we talked about those. Lyso, break down, lysis. Zymes, enzymes, enzymes that break down. Like the lysozymes in our tear. Okay? Defensine, defensine is coming from defense. So this is a secretion, a chemical that is that can break down bacteria and fungi. Uh, the pH of the skin, I talked about this. The sweat is slightly acidic, pH. Why is it acidic? Because we secrete lactic acid. 
Uh, what else in, uh, this is on the skin. What else in the sweat? High electrolyte concentration. We know that the sweat contains a lot of electrolyte, right? right? Mm -hmm. Sodium chloride and others. How about the stomach? We have hydrochloric acid. In the intestine, the digestive enzymes are going to digest, right? Doesn't have to be an acid, digest. So even if something passed the stomach with the acidity and go to the intestine, can you still break it down? Yes, we have a lot of enzymes. Uh, semen, does the semen have uh, 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 its own protection or chemicals as well? Yes, it contains antimicrobial agents as well. It contains some chemicals, so if there is a pathogen in the semen, it will be broken down, it will be killed. Vagina is acidic, right? Uh, and this acidity is maintained by microbiota. What's the microbiota? The normal flora. And can you tell me why is it acidic? What is secreted to make it acidic? Not from the vagina itself. What exactly is secreted to make it acidic? There is an acid. What is that acid? Lactic acid. Yes. Why? Because of the lactobacilli. Lactobacilli. Make lactic acid. Lactobacilli, lactic acid. And lactobacilli, these are the m uh, one of the normal flora of the vagina. Did you get the chemicals? How about the genetic defense? Remember, just to, to keep focusing, we're still talking about the first line. Okay? First line is non-specific. In the first line, we have three defenses. All of them make the first. Physical barriers, that's number one. Chemical barriers. That's number two. Genetic barrier, that's number three. Or physical, chemical, and genetic defenses. Is that okay so far? We did the physical and the chemical. Now, the genetic. What's the genetic barrier? The genetic barrier or the genetic defense are our genes, our genes are giving us some abilities to be resistant to certain organisms without it doing anything. It just make ourselves not uh, not a good environment. The example of that is distemper. Distemper of, from the cats. This is uh, a microbe that can infect the cats. It cannot infect us. Why? The genetic, our genetics making ourselves resistant. We didn't do anything. It's just in the genes. Okay? Uh, mums. If you have mums and you're dealing with cats, the cats will never catch up mumps, will never be infected. This is interesting. Why? The genes of the all of them, it's not special. All of the cats have genetic components that make them resistant. Okay? So this is obviously, it's, it's innate, right? Nothing is developed, nothing is changing. They are born with this. Uh, the other thing is something that's interesting, and we talked about it in pathophysiology, if you still remember. Uh, do you remember sickle cell disease and sickle cell traits? Protected against what? Malaria. malaria. Remember this? They cannot get malaria. Why? Something in the genes. Okay? They cannot get malaria. So this is for the first line. Second line is that specific or non-specific? Still non-specific. Both first and second line are innate. Both of them are non-specific. What's the second line? IP thick. IP thick. Remember it somehow. You need to remember those. Inflammation, phagocytosis, fever, interferon, and complement. And we will talk about the details. IP thick. IP thick. Inflammation, phagocytosis, fever, interferon, complement. Do you see this uh, before we move to the details? So you just need to have the whole map. IP thick. Okay, can you answer this question for me? Inflammation is not a first line. What is the inflammation? Is it specific or non-specific? Still non-specific, but second line. Everything else, is that the first line? Yes, these are all physical and chemical barriers. So yes, it is inflammation. 
So a little bit of details about inflammation, and we know that already. I told you that this chapter, most of it is repeat, okay? Inflammation is non-specific second line, and the cardinal signs are, I think you remember it, redness, hotness, pain, swelling, right? But beside that, we need also to remember, if you forgot, how is each one of those developed? Besides, there is another name for that that you need to know. Like redness is also called color or rubber. Apien is also called dollar. Okay? So we need to remember this. This is another name for it. Uh, redness, swelling, warmth, or um, heat. All of these three are happening because vasodilation. Okay? Why are you getting redness? Vasodilation, more blood is coming to the area, isn't the blood red? So it will become more red, right? This is the redness. Swelling, why the swelling? It's edema. Why edema? Same reason. Vasodilation, more fluid come, causing edema. Is that clear? So besides remembering all these four, you need to know why each one of those is happening. Warmth, why the heat is coming to this area? Same reason. Vasodilation, increased blood flow. So you notice that all three are caused by vasodilation, increased blood flow. Okay, so far? Pain, which is called dollar. This is stimulation of the nerve endings. By what? By some chemicals that are released from the injured cells. So our injured cells release some chemicals. Uh, bradykinin, prostaglandin, uh, that's a couple of things, don't worry about it, just remember how it, it happened. Pain is coming because you stimulate the nerve endings, okay? Uh, if you still remember, uh, if after the inflammation, uh, some of the white blood cells will die, some of the microbes will die, there will be some debris, if that come together and surrounded by fibrous tissue, that will be pus, right? So this picture is showing you the same thing. You have injury, then it become red, swollen, pain, and also loss of function. Uh, this is one that was not mentioned, but it's one of the signs, loss of function, of that inflamed area temporarily. Um, leukocytes, the white blood cells, have some unique characteristics that you need to remember. Diapedesis and chemotaxis. Dia means a lot, multiple. Pedesis, ped. What's ped? Like pedal. Foot. Foot. So diapedesis, multiple, multiple feet. Multiple, uh, which is um, they move the amoebic type of movement. They make a lot of feet extensions and this is how they move and this is how they migrate which is this look at this like feeds are going to form in different directions so, so that it can move from one spot to the other the other thing is chemotaxis chemo means chemical taxis means attraction so what's the chemotaxis chemical attraction chemical attraction cut the word into two pieces diapedesis chemotaxis Diabetes, is multiple for multiple uh, uh, feet. Uh, chemotaxis, chemical attraction. Chemical attraction to what? The, um, uh, the 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 cells that are injured and some of the white blood cells are releasing chemicals. These chemicals will attract other cells to that side of inflammation or infection. Is that clear? So you have injury. You have inflammation or infection, whatever it is. It doesn't have to be infection, okay? Inflammation or infection. So the, the injured area that have inflammation or infection, uh, there, there will be some chemicals released, and these chemicals are going to attract other cells. Is that clear? Uh, phagocytosis. What's phagocytosis means? Hmm? Engulfing the eaters, yes. So phagocytosis is eating or engulfing other cells. And we have two types, 
And again, this is all kind of repeat, but if you forgot, this is consider it uh, refreshing our information. Micro and macrophage. Macrophage are the small eaters. Where did they, do they come from? From which white blood cell? Hmm? Neutrophils. Neutrophils. And macrophage, they come from? Microcytes. Monocytes, yes. Monocytes. So microphage come from neutrophils. Uh, micro. Macrophage, the big ones, come from the monocytes. Okay? Um, so microphage come from neutrophils. When they react with bacteria or damaged cells. Micro. Uh, macro come from monocytes. So macro come from? Macro come from what? Macro. Monocytes. How the monocytes become mac uh, macrophages? How they are going to change to that? They leave the monocytes. The monocytes, they have their phagocytic activities. But when they leave the bloodstream and they go to the tissues, now they are going to change to macrophage or there is another thing that's called dendritic cells, the, the, depending on where is the location. Are we following? So monocytes have already have phagocytic activities? Yes, it does, okay? But is it going to change to macrophage? How? Change to macrophage if they leave the bloodstream and the inflammatory mediators are going to change them into macrophage or dendritic cells. Macrophage is everywhere. Dendritic cells is basically uh, at the CNS. Uh, are these macrophage and dendritic cells, are, what are they, what's going to happen to them? They are going to float around this area, but sometimes they go to organ and stay in there. Okay, can you answer this question? Non-specific, yes. And is this is first line or second line? Second line. Are you sure? This is all second line. So this is a mix. Okay, and mucous membrane is first, and inflammation pericytosis is second. Yeah. Both first and second are non specific. Okay? So it's non specific. Uh, are, we, are we following so far? Yeah. Okay. If you have any questions, stop me at any time. I know it's easy, but again, uh, it's a chapter, it will count, so we need to remember everything here. Fever. Fever is increased body temperature, right? Mm -hmm. the, 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 the agent or the chemical that, uh, that elicits or that stimulates the, the hypothalamus to increase the body temperature is called pyrogens. Pyro means heat or fever. Pyro. Uh, gens means generators or formation so pyrogen are the fever generators okay these fever generators are going to go to the hypothalamus remember the hypothalamus have uh, a set point for the body temperature which is 37 or 98.6 this is how the hypothalamus is set it's just like uh, the um, uh, the air condition right exactly like the air condition so this is how it's set um, if a pyrogen come, it will go to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus is going to change, the set point is going to change, and then the, 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 the fever will be produced. How is the fever going to be produced? Muscle, this is the main thing, how our body temperature increase. Muscles are going to contract, which is the main thing, and vasoconstriction to keep our heat. Both of those combined lead to elevation of body temperature, which is fever, okay? So what's a pyrogen? It's a fever generator, right? A chemical that go to the hypothalamus 
to generate heat. Um, this pyrogen can be exogenous or endogenous. Okay? What's exogenous mean? Coming from outside. Endogenous is coming from inside. From outside, like the pathogen itself. Like a pathogen invading us, releasing chemicals. These chemicals are pyrogens. Inside, this is from inside our body. And these can be secreted from monocytes, neutrophils, or macrophages. Okay, these factors include interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factors. Are we okay so far? Okay. So fever, pyrogen. Now, why is the fever good? The fever is not something that we like to have, but it, does it have a benefit? Is it good? Yes. There are different things that are good or that are beneficial because of the fever. Number one, it's in, it, it inhibits multiplication of some microorganisms. I told you before that most of the microorganisms love our normal body temperature. If it is 37, 98.6, that's perfect. Okay? Once you change, that's not good for them. Okay? They are not going to multiply. Not all of them. A lot of them. Is that, is that point okay? So this is one. So making the environment bad for them. This is one. Uh, number one. Number two, it's going to impede the nutrition of the bacteria. Like it will make the, 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 the nutrition uh, that the bacteria need less, uh, the availability will become uh, less, less availability. Uh, it reduces the iron, the, the presence of heat somehow, uh, it will reduce the iron available. This is two. Number three, when the body temperature goes up, metabolism is going to accelerate. Okay? And when metabolism accelerates, you're getting more energy. And the immune response is going to be stimulated as well. So most importantly, fever inhibit bacterial growth and speed up body reactions. Is that okay so far? So what's good about the fever? Environment is not good anymore. This is one. Impede nutrition. This is two. Stimulate metabolism. What's good about increasing metabolism? energy and stimulating the immune response because of the presence of the energy. So all of these are the benefits of the fever. Uh, next one is interferon. Interferon, just to remember, is it interferes with the replication of the virus and cancer cells. Interferon interfere with the replication. Clear? Interferon interfere with the replication of the virus and cancer cells. What is the interferon in the first place? It's a protein, a small protein, produced from some white blood cells and some tissue cells, like the tissue, the cells that have cancer. Um, produced in response to viral infection. So the cell is invaded by virus. The cell is going to make interferon. Okay? Uh, it, uh, 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 as a result of immune response. Antigen antibody reaction. So th this is how it's going to be stimulated. And when you see the interferon, when the interferon is released, the surrounding tissues will know that this area is inflamed, invaded, so they will be warned. So this is a warning sign for the surrounding tissues. Did you get the interferon? Small protein, released by white blood cells and some tissues. It interfere with the replication of virus and cancer cells. Produce in response to viral infection or immune products or antigen. And it is an early sign to the surrounding tissues that they should know that there is some sort of inflammation or infection at this point. Or these cells are invaded. So this is how the interferon, this picture is showing you the interferon, how is it 
produced and it's going to block the viral replication. Next one is complement. Uh, complement, just to, to tell you where the name came from, complement is a system of proteins as well with the interferon protein. Are we following? Was the interferon protein too? Yes, it's a small protein. Interferon is a small protein. Complement is also protein. So both interferon and complement are proteins, different types of proteins. So complement is also proteins in the blood, about 26 different types of proteins that complement complement the function of the antibodies. This is where the name came from. They complement the function of antibodies. Why? To kill the bacteria and to kill the virus. So they complement the function of the lymphocytes, basically. This is where the name came from, okay? Complement system is a system of proteins that complement the function of lymphocytes. Speci more specifically, the antibodies. So to, to help uh, destroying bacteria and viruses. Uh, it's important to remember that complement is always there. You have complement all the time. Unlike interferon, interferon is produced when you have an issue, right? Complement, you don't have an issue. It's there all the time. Even if you don't have pathogen yet, it's there and ready, but it's not activated yet. Is that clear? Do we have complement all the time? Yes, we do, but it's not activated yet. You don't have pathogen, you don't have any issue, you still have the complement. It's not active. Have to activate two ways, which we call it the cascade. Cascade means like dominoes effect. One after one after one. So cascade, uh, it can be a classical cascade or classical pathway or an alternative one. The classical one is the uh, is is uh, is um, uh, activate is an activation because of the presence of antibodies that are bound to microorganisms meaning it is a microorganism inside our blood you produce antibodies and the antibodies attach to the microorganism this is going to activate the complement that's already there clear this is the normal pathway or the classical pathway the alternative pathway is start when the complement proteins, it's at 26, 26 proteins, clear? 26 different types of proteins. We don't know, need to know the details, but just remember it's 26 types of proteins. So when these 26 types of proteins, or some of them, when they bind to normal cells and the surface component of the microorganisms, it will be activated. This is an alternative, so this is not the normal pathway, an alternative pathway. Did we get the idea about the complement? Okay, answer this question for me. Interferon, right? Interferon interfere with the viral replication and the cancer cell replication. Here is another one. It's acting which of the bone is not true. Interfere, what does it do? It's not responsible for pain, right? Interfere is not responsible for pain. But is it produced because of viral infection? Is it a protein? Does it inhibit replication? Is it an early warning to the surroundings? Yes. Okay, so we did, so far, the first and the second line of defenses. Are we following? The first line of defense was physical barriers, chemical barriers, and genetic barriers. Second line of defense, the IP fit. Okay, inflammation, what else? Phagocytosis, phagocytosis. Interferon and complement, IB thick. 
IP fake. IP, you know the IP, the IP address? IP fake. Okay, five things. Okay, so this is the first and second line. Um, we are going to do the third line, which is the, the lymphocytes, T and B, in the next chapter. But generally speaking, just as an introduction, immunology is the study of the second and third, not the first one. The first one is just the, the defenses, the natural defenses, which is the physical and, and chemical values. Okay? Uh, so the immune system is responsible for Number one, surveillance of the body. It's always going around, so if something happened, you should pick it up and understand what's happening. This is one. The other thing is, one of the functions of the immune system is to know the cells. Are these our cells, are these cells, or non-cells? How? By detecting the antigen. What's happening is, our immune system has a memory. This memory is produced in the uterus, where, where, it, where we were fetus, okay? So during fetal time, what's happening is our immune system is introduced to every single antigen in our body. This is your skin antigen, this is your liver antigen, right? All antigens, and you are going to create a memory. So when you see your cells, you're not going to attack, right? If you see anything that's not programmed, in your memory, this is considered a foreign cell that you should attack. What do you call it if you forgot one or more of your antigen and you start to attack your own antigen? Autoimmune disease, yes. Which we, we're not talking about that right now, but just it's related. Um, so these are the functions. Surveillance is one. You know self from non-self. That's two, attack the non-self, that's three. So the white blood cells, they have an innate capacity. We are born with it, is that clear? You are born with everything already programmed in your white blood cells. Your white blood cells right after birth, they already know which is self and which is not self. Now, if we're talking about a broader aspect of the immune system, in order to do the, immu the immunity that's required, you need the whole different systems integrating with each other. These systems are reticular endothelial system, this is one. Extracellular fluid, this is two. Blood bloodstream, this is three, lymphatic system, that's four. You need to remember this. What are the components or the compartments of the immune system? Reticular endothelial system, extracellular fluid, bloodstream, lymphatic system. What's the difference between extracellular fluid and blood? Is it the same thing? No, extracellular fluid is any fluid outside of the cells. Blood is outside of the cells, but inside the vessel. Okay, so if it is in between the cells, we, we call it extracellular and lymphatic. So you need to remember those four. Okay, we take the cellular system, extracellular fluid, bloodstream, lymphatic system. And all of those are going to work together. If you look at this picture here, it will show you the bloodstream, the extracellular fluid, uh, the lymphatic system, and reticular and cell system, we will talk about it. Okay, can you answer this question for me? If you're paying attention. Yeah, extracellular fluid is not part of it, right? Okay, what's the reticular endothelial system that you have to know? What's that reticular endothelial system? 
Reticular endothelial system is a network of connective tissue fibers that interconnect cells and make a network of connective tissue surrounding different organs like spleen and liver for example like bone marrow okay if you look at the spleen if you look at the bone marrow if you look at the liver you will see connective tissue fibers surrounding and it is making networks in, in um, uh, over the place um, it's one obviously of the major divisions of the immune system what are the four divisions the reticular and zero system is one. What else? Extracellular fluid is two. Bloodstream, that's three. Lymphatic, that's four. So it's one of the four, right? What is it? It's a connective tissue, fibrous tissue, making a network surrounding the organs. This is what we call the reticular and zero system. Okay? And what does it contain? It contains phagocytic cells. The mononuclear phagocytic system, which is the monocytes that become the macrophage. So they contain the macrophage, uh, uh, was the macrophage part of the first or the second line of defense? Second. So the sequential system is helping by making this network and it will contain the macrophages. If you bypass somehow, if you cross the first line, that skin, mucous membrane and all that, this is going to stop you because it, they contain the macrophages. When you talk about the second one is the blood, bloodstream. The blood consists of two components. These two components are plasma and formed elements. Plasma is the liquid part of the blood. Formed cells are the three different types of cells. What are the three different types of cells? White blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets, yes, three. Anything else besides those cells, we call it the plasma, which is the fluid portion. Uh, the plasma consists of 92% of, uh, of it is water. At least remember that the vast majority is water, okay? 90% is water. It also contains albumin, globulin, and clotting factors. And other things, but are, these are the most important ones. You have some proteins, albumin, globulin, and clotting factors. Do you remember those? Albumin, globulin, when we did the blood, albumin, <coughs> globulin, and clotting factors. Albumin is for viscosity and carrier. Globulin, like immunoglobulins, right? This is for defense, and also some of it work as a carrier. Clotting factors, like what? Fibrinogen, fibrinogen specifically, fibrinogen, right? Albumin, globulin, and fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is a clotting factor. So most important components are water and plasma proteins. What are the plasma proteins? Albumin, globulin, clotting factor specifically fibrinogen. That will be activated into fibrin later on. Now, this is the plasma, which is the fluid part, right? What's the difference between plasma and serum? Yes, serum is the same as plasma minus clotting factors. What happened is if you take a sample of the blood outside of your body, the clotting factors go are going to activate and it will make a clot. You don't have it anymore. You don't have it anymore. It's a clot. So it's the plasma minus clotting factors. Why? Because it's already clotted. Like this picture here. Clotted, and you end up having only two. How about the blood cells? So we said the blood is plasma and blood cells, right? Um, hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis, the same thing. What's poiesis means? Or poison? Formation. So hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis is the production of the blood cells, which are platelets, red blood cells, white blood cells. There is another name for those. White blood cells are called leukocytes. Platelets are called thrombocytes. And red cells are called erythrocytes. Yes. So our focus is on the leukocytes, which is the white. 
because we're talking about immunity now, right? So uh, these white blood cells are granulocytes and A granulocytes. What's A mean? No or without? So those that have granules are called granulocytes. Those who do not have granules are called A granulocytes. You need to notice that those that have granules, their nucleus is lobed, like multiple lobes. Those that does not have granulocytes, they also, uh, they, they, besides not having the granulocytes, the, the nucleus is unlobed. It's just a round nucleus. Did you get the difference? Granulocytes, two things. They have granules and the nucleus is lobed. A granulocytes do not have granules plus the nucleus is not lobed. It's round. One of the granulocytes is a neutrophil. Neutrophil is that going to become a macrophage or macrophage? Micro. What's going to become the macro? Monocytes. So neutrophil is one, and this is um, the major component of the white blood cell. And this is one of the first responders. Like neutrophil is all, all over the place. If something happened, neutrophils go to it. Okay? And if I did uh, blood analysis, and I see that neutrophils are higher than normal, I know that you have bacterial infection. Do you remember this? What, what if I see that your eosinophils are high? Allergy or worms, which is the parasites, right? What if you see mast cells increase? Mast cells and basophils, what does that mean? What do you have? Inflammation. Inflammation. Yes. Okay. Uh, mast cells, allergy, and inflammation, basophils are inflammation. Okay? Uh, we call that the differential count. Like you're telling me uh, wh uh, white blood cells are high. It's, it's supposed to be from 7 to 10 or 11 thousands. It's 20 thousands. Uh, I will tell you, can you be more specific and tell me which one of them is exactly increasing? Neutrophils, you have bacterial infection. It is uh, eosinophils. I will tell you you have either parasite or allergy, right? Mast cells, inflammation or allergy. Uh, basophils, inflammation. So eosinophils is the next one. We have small number of these uh, eosinophils, and it means that you have parasitic infection or allergy, also related to inflammation because of the chemical component of that, but it's mainly parasitic and allergy. Basophils is allergy and also inflammation. There is an overlap. Mast cells, inflammation and allergy. So basophils, remember inflammation and allergy. Lymphocytes is different. This is a granulocyte. So what, 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 what about the nucleus? What do you think about the nucleus? Is it lobed or not lobed? Mm. Not lobed. Is it round? Yes. yes. So lymphocytes, this is about 20 to 35%. And is that specific or non-specific? Specific. Is that the first or second or third line? Third line. Third line, yes. So we're not going to discuss the details. But just as an introduction, details will be discussed next chapter. Generally speaking, lymphocytes are two types, B and T. B are responsible for antibody-mediated immunity. The other name is humoral immunity. So what's the function of B? Humoral, also known as antibody-mediated. Um, does anybody remember when B cells, when they start to secrete the antibodies, they maturate and become what? Memory cells. Hmm? Memory cells? Memory cells? Mm -hmm. No. It's, it changed to something and then secrete the antibodies. To other types of cells. More mature cells. Plasma cells. Plasma cells. So B cells become plasma cells and secrete the antibodies. It's not mentioned here, we will talk about it. I'm just uh, refreshing your information. T cells, on the other hand, are responsible for cell mediated. Cell mediated. So they can kill pathogens and foreign cells. 
cell mediated means the cells themselves kill, unlike the bee that uh, secretes antibodies and the antibodies are going to kill. Monocytes. Monocytes are about 3 to 7 percent. You need to remember the average number. Not exactly, but at least the average. And these are the large ones. Uh, the shape of the monocytes is kidney shaped and these are the macrophage macrophage and when monocytes change and become macrophage remember the when they leave the bloodstream and they are exposed to inflammatory agents which is because of the presence of pathogens but when they exposed to inflammatory agents lymphatic system this is the next one so we talked about the blood, we talked about the reticular and serial system, right? Lymphatic system. Lymphatic system from uh, physiology and anatomy, if you still remember, um, the, the lymphatic system is a system that's going to collect the extra amount of extracellular fluid. Do you remember that or not? Do you remember from the capillaries fluid leave out? in between the cells and come back, right? Not all of it come back. Part of it will come back through the lymphatic system. And why are you doing that? Why not every fluid that left capillaries go to the cells? Why all, not all of it return back? You need to force it to go through the lymphatics. So what is the function of the lymphatics? Number one, providing a, a, a route for the extra amount, return of the extra serial fluid. That's one. Number two, as you are moving within the lymphatics, we're going to kill the pathogens and clean the, the, uh, the, the lymph. Okay? Um, so it's going to do surveillance function, like as the lymph is returning, you need to look at it and see if there's something wrong with it. Recognition, you need to recognize anything bad, toxins, pathogens, whatever it is. And you should, you should take care of it as you're moving. These are the lymphatics. Uh, do, you, do you guys remember this? Yeah. Thoracic duct and red lymphatic duct and all that stuff. Okay, this is a comparison between a regular systemic capillaries and a lymphatic capillary. Okay, uh, we, I know we did that before. Refresh your information. Uh, lymphatic capillaries are different. See how this is continuous like this? This is blind ended. It looks like pouch shaped. It's wider, okay? Blind ended, pocket shaped. So it is different. Lymph is that fluid that is returning back through the lymphatic system. Do we know what's the main difference between lymph and plasma? What was not filtered out from the capillaries in the first place? Something that's large. Huh? Proteins. Proteins. So the difference is the protein amount. Plasma proteins. Do you remember what can cross the capillaries? Everything that's very small. Is the protein small? No, it's not. So the protein doesn't leave in the first place. You still have some proteins that's already there. But which one contain more proteins, lymph or plasma? Plasma, because it didn't leave the plasma. Plasma contain more uh, proteins. Okay, so I take the extracellular fluids back to the circulation. Uh, it's just remember that it's similar to the plasma, but less proteins, plasma proteins. Okay, and it's going to take transport extracellular fluid that can contain some white blood cells, fat. Uh, this is in the digestive system only. Do you remember this? Um, hmm? It's it's helping the. Uh, it's called the lacteals. Lacteal. Uh, it take any debris, any infectious agents, any chemicals, any toxins, anything that's not supposed to be there. It will take it back. So here are the capillaries. And they are all over the place, but not CNS, bone, placenta, or thymus. These are four spots that does not have it. 
Uh, other than that, it's uh, or it's not permeating there. And in, in other spots, it's permeating. Means it's allow things to go in and out. Uh, the wall is thin, and it is pocket shaped. Um, and the the wall because it's thin, it, it, it allow extracellular fluid to move. And skeletal muscles, when they contract, they push it up, just like the veins, if you still remember. So does the lymphatic system, lymphatics, do they have valve? The lymphatic capillaries, they do have valves, just like the veins, not the arteries. Arteries, arterioles, capillaries, no. What have valves, veins, of course, plus lymphatic capillaries. It's not a, a regular valve, it's not just some cells are protruding like this to make a valve. That's why it moves in one direction only. So you always start with the capillaries that are blind-ended, pocket-shaped. That's going to pick up anything that's not supposed to be there. Foreign material, anything that's not supposed to be there. And it is move, it's going to move from there to larger lymphatics, and as it is moving, it will be filtered out and cleaned by the lymph nodes. Uh, so lymph nodes are on the way of the lymphatic system. It's on, on all, all over the place. Uh, and it's going to take anything that's not supposed to be there. Until, until the largest lymphatics that return back to the venous system are, does anybody remember? What are the largest lymphatics? N not lymphocytes, N not the, the white blood cells, lymphatics. Lymphatics are the lymph vessels. What's the largest to turn back? Do you remember this? Thoracic duct and right lymphatic duct. Uh, this part is drained by right lymphatic duct. The rest of the whole body, thoracic duct. Do you remember superior inferior vena cava are the largest veins that take the blood back to the heart? What are the largest lymphatics? Remember when you say lymphatics, you're talking about the lymph, the lymph vessels, vessels, vessels. So the largest are right lymphatic and thoracic duct. So here it is. This is the systemic circulation. Red arteries, look at the capillaries and then return back to the veins. Some of the extracellular fluid is trapped in between the cells. The lymphatics will take it back, and look as you're moving, what are these? The in The lymph nodes. The lymph nodes. So as you're moving, you'll see lymph nodes. The lymph nodes, when they pass in front of the lymph, or, uh, or inside the lymph node, they are going to take anything that's not supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. I'm saying anything means anything. Toxins, foreign body, uh, pathogens, debris, anything that's not supposed to be there. So it will be filtered, 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 filtered until you go back to these, which is the two that I talked about. Right and fake duct and plastic duct, and it's going to drain into um, uh, the um, subclavian veins. The organs. We have a term that you need to know that's called lymphoid organs and lymphoid tissues. If you're talking about the whole organ, it's different than when you talk about tissues. What are the organs? Primary organs are bone marrow and thighs. Okay, primary organs. This is a whole organ that's doing the function of lymphoid, lymphoid function. Uh, and this is where the lymphocytes originate and maturate. This is where we make the lymphocytes and maturate. Bone marrow is where we make both B and T. So where do we make both of them lymphocytes? At the bone marrow. Where do you activate? This is something else. Where they are going to maturate. The bone marrow also maturates B. Thymus is what maturate T. And this is where the name came from. Okay. So the name, did the name come from the origin or from the site of maturation? Site of maturation. The origin is the same. Both B and T come from? 
bone marrow. But they maturate in different spots. If they maturate in the bone marrow, the first letter is B, bone marrow. So these are the B cells. If they activate it by the thymus, thymus, the first letter is T, and that's why we call it the T cells. For the thymus, you need to remember the following. When you're born, your thymus is, the, is large, large enough. It's the largest size. Okay? The thymus will be large enough. And then at puberty, it starts to shrink. With the age advance, it will become atrophic. So if you later on, like 50s, 60s, if you look at the thymus, you see some remnants, or you might not see anything. Okay? So it deteriorates by age. So what's, what, what's the largest size of the thymus? During which age? Largest? At birth. At birth. This is the largest. And it starts to deteriorate. By puberty, it will be deteriorated a lot. With old age, it's completely atrophic. You, you might see some remnants. So these are the primary organs. What are the primary organs? bone marrow and and thymus. These are called the primary organs. What are the secondary organs or tissues? Lymph nodes and spleen. So lymph nodes and spleen are secondary, not primary. Okay? Lymph nodes are being shaped and it's, it's in, the, in the roots of all the lymphatics. We talked about those. It's clustered in different spots. Uh, you guys were talking about this, right? Where do you examine? You're examining these clusters, okay? These clusters are here in the armpit, around the neck. You should feel it here, here, here. This group is called supraclavicular, right? This is the axillary. This is the cervical, and so on. We have also here, right? Uh, spleen, on the other hand, is also a secondary organ. Uh, and the function of the spleen is to filter pathogen and warn red blood cells, warn out red blood cells. So what's the function of the spleen? Filter, two things. What is it filtering? Pathogens and worn out red blood cells, like aged red blood cells. After 120 days, you take it out of the circulation. Okay? It's kind of similar to the lymph nodes, but this is the function. Okay, can you answer this question for me? In the thymus. Because the T come from first letter of the thymus. That's it.